This week's episode of the Skeptic Zone podcast is brought to you by SkepticBros.com, importers of the fabulous Placebo Band. Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic Zone, episode 107 for the 5th of November, 2010. Richard Saunders here with you once again from Sydney, Australia. Wet and raining Sydney, Australia. The sound of uh, rain on the roof isn't too bad though. On this week's show we've got a bit of a mixed bag for you, a bit of a, a random selection. We'll start off with a report that I wrote for The Skeptic magazine about... Uh, my adventures and those of uh, Dr. Rachi Joe Benamu Aran Segev at the Amazing Meeting 8 in Las Vegas. Yes, we're still talking about it months after the event. It was that good. And that was recorded at uh, Sydney Skeptics in the Pub. Following that, we have Dr. Rachi reports where Dr. Rachi herself is being interviewed on Adelaide Radio about uh, a recent uh, outbreak of whooping cough in the Adelaide area. Very interesting information from Dr. Rachi on the other end of the microphone. After that, we have a report that I wrote for the Skeptics website, skeptics.com.au, about the sad situation here in Australia, at least, where chemist shops and pharmacies are continuing to sell magic and witchcraft. And to wrap up the show, we have an interview with our good friend Jason Brown about a very recent story here where a, a, a newspaper was more or less spruiking a holographic power magic band. We'll find out more about that soon. Thank you to all those people sending in drink ideas for the official drink of the Skeptic Zone. We've had some uh, interesting ideas come in. Don't forget that uh, when I say drink, I don't mean it has to be alcoholic. There are fabulous drinks out there. Um, root beer, hint, hint, that I really love, which aren't alcoholic. So any sort of drink will do. Root beer. Mm, that's it. That's it, folks. I'm going downstairs. I'm going to grab myself a nice cold root beer, sit back, and enjoy the Skeptic Zone. A group of us, three of us, Arantz Agiva, our president, Dr. Rachi and myself, recently made the journey to the amazing meeting in Las Vegas. And Joe. And Joe. I'm sorry, Joe. You're hiding behind the pillar. <laughs> she doesn't exist. Mm. I should remember Joe because she lost her underwear. But what I mean by that... <laughs> what I mean by that is when we arrived in the cassette... Let, I tell you what. I tell you what. I'll give you a sneak preview of the next uh, Skeptic magazine. Tim is our editor. And I don't have permi permission from him to read you this. This is the report from the amazing meeting, the James Randi amazing meeting in Las Vegas. Here we go. This report is entitled Breakfast with James Randi. A, a report on yet... I'll do it this way. Ah, that's better. Uh, a report on yet another truly amazing meeting. Since 2003, the James Randi Educational Foundation, the JREF, has held its annual amazing meeting, TAM, now the premier skeptical, skeptical convention in the world. Originally in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it moved to Las Vegas in 2004. My first TAM was TAM 6 in 2008, where I was honored to be included on the bill as a guest speaker. I used my time on stage to give a demonstration on how water diviners uh, can be tested. And that uh, video is available online. You can check out skeptics.com.au to see that. This year I was joined on the long flight across the Pacific by TAM, committee, uh, TAM Australia Committee and Skeptics Own members, Dr. Rachel Dunlop, Joanne Benamou, see I've remembered you this time, and Iran Sergev. Iran Sergev. Where's Iran Sergev? Behind the pillar. <laughs> um, 
As much as, as we were looking forward to the event itself and the wealth of prominent speakers, Richard Dawkins, Banachek, Phil Plait, Simon Singh, amongst many others, we were under no illusions about goofing off. We were there to work, and work we did. Our goals were twofold. Firstly, to promote our own TAM, TAM Australia, in November this year, which will be held one block in that direction, the Masonic Centre. And we were there to sell special reserve tickets to international people. We were also there to gather interviews for The Skeptic magazine, as edited by Tim Menden, and interviews for our own Skeptic Zone podcast. From time to time over the four days, we were also ourselves interviewed by other people from other skeptical organizations and podcasts. But I digress. Let's pick up the adventure as three sleep deprived skeptics, Rachel, Joanne, and myself, Iran joined us the next day, arrived mid morning at the South Point Casino in scorching hot Las Vegas, minus our luggage that somehow missed the connecting flights from Los Angeles. Oh well, these things happen. We arrived a few days early to unwind, relax, get over jet lag, but not a hope. As soon as we walked into the casino, we discovered a horde of eager delegates were already there. We were quickly caught up in the excitement of socializing with people keen to talk to us about our activities in Australia. For we three, the priority was staying awake, through the day to adjust to the time zone and hopefully being reunited with our bags with clean underwear. That's why Joe lost her underwear, you see. That happy meeting would not happen until 1am the next morning. Day two, and I awoke feeling somewhat peckish. What a surprise. <laughs> I wandered down the corridor to Joanne and Rachel's room and knocked on the door. Joanne was up and seemed astoundingly bright while Rachel was catching up on lost sleep. <clears throat> so Joanne and I slipped down to the main casino floor where can be found no end of eating opportunities. We entered the cafe looking for breakfast and was surprised to find none other than James Randy himself together with his partner Jose Alvarez. Richard! exclaimed Randy and greeted me with a hug. He then gave Joanne a hug, much to her amazement, as she had never met the man, and invited us both to, his, to share his table. Over the, thex, uh, over the next 30 minutes, we spent the time updating Randy as to events in Australia, and then listening to him recall his experiences going through chemotherapy and his recovery. I must say that he is looking very well indeed for a man of his age, almost 82, and given his recent medical concerns, Presently, he and Jose left, left us to finish our pancakes. I looked over at Joanne, who was, I think, ready to burst. That was amazing, she giggled, and I had to agree. <laughs> Maybe it was something to do with the underwear, I don't know. But there was one more surprise for us when we asked the waiter for our bill. Oh, said the waiter, the older man who was here took care of that. Mm, wow. Iran arrived later that day, meeting up with us after a paltry three hours sleep to plan our time at the amazing meeting. We had amazing meeting t-shirts from Australia, copies of the skeptic and other information placed on our table just outside the main convention hall. The plan was that one or more of us would always be at the table to talk to people, sell TAM Australia tickets, and promote the Australian skeptics. I am pleased to say this is exactly what we did over the next four days. Indeed, our table seemed to turn into a popular meeting spot with friends and others keeping us company. The next days now seem to be lost in a blur of very late nights, very early morning, endless hours at the information table, giving away Tim Tams, Minties, Vegemite, Mustics and going to parties, meetings with other speakers, attending whatever presentations we could, gaining new and valuable networking channels, and somehow managing to end up in a giant hot tub with 30 of our closest friends. <laughs> it must have been close friends. They were very close friends. Indeed, I'll have to wait for the convention DVD so I can at last see the presentations. A highlight of TAM for me, personally, was being asked by Dr. Steve Novella of the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast to be the guest auctioneer at the dinner for their fans and supporters. Although I have a, no experience of that sort of thing, I gave it my best shot and somehow pulled it off. Lots of laughs, lots of fun, and lots of high bids to help our dear friends at the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. We look forward to seeing them soon in TAM Australia. 
Then came Sunday afternoon and the last official event of TAM 8, a demonstration, not so much of a test, of Anita Iconin, I think her name is, a young lady from Los Angeles who claimed to be able to detect which of five volunteers was missing a kidney. Together with the preamble interviews with Randy Allison Smith from the Randy Educational Foundation, the event took about two hours, which perhaps tested the patience of some in the audience. Nevertheless, it was a good example of what the JREF and indeed groups like Australian skeptics must do in order to test such claims. A lot of people don't realize how hard it is to test claims of the paranormal and the supernatural. It's just not a matter of someone coming up and doing whatever they're supposed to do. There are so many conditions and and things in writing and things we have to agree to. And the usual case is that people don't end up being tested because they can never agree to all the conditions and they get lost and confused and it, it is very a very difficult thing. So TAM 8 wrapped up with many heli, uh, happy delegates, over 1,300, heading home to all corners of the globe. Many of the talks at TAM have resonated long after the convention ended. Phil Plate's speech on how, to best, how best to deliver the message of skepticism has affectionately been renamed Don't Be a Dick (laughs) and is still creating a buzz in sceptical circles. Bruce M. Hood and Carol Travis left us thinking about the science behind belief and whether any of us is ever really free of flawed thinking. Try saying that six times, Joe, after a few champagnes. Monday was at long last a chance for the Australian team to relax. We also had time to try the one and a half pound of crab legs on special for $17 and have been raving about it ever since. (laughs) But there was one last surprise for us. That night, Rachel and I bumped into James Randi, who seemed to be at a loose end as to dinner arrangements. I offered him to be our guest, and he accepted. It was another unforgettable meal with Randi filling us in about his life in skepticism and his adventures and Rachel and I filling in James Randi about our efforts against the anti-vaccination crowd. It was a perfect way to round off our journey to Las Vegas. So that report will be in the next issue of The Skeptic I'm Magazine. Not in <laughs> I've spoiled it all. If you don't subscribe to The Skeptic Magazine, it is one of the premier skeptical journals in the world. Our editor is right here, Tim Mendham. He'll be happy to chat with you and tell you how good it is. And it is, it is a great journal. It's been going since about 1981. It's one of the oldest skeptical journals in the world. TAM 8 for Los, in Las Vegas was a wonderful experience for us. And it's just whetted our appetite for Australian TAM the 26th to the 28th of November here in Sydney. Hey, Bru. Oh, hey, Bru. I see you're admiring my new clear placebo band. No, I'm not. That's right. From SkepticBros.com, the all-new Clear Placebo Band. Oh, I didn't even ask. Clear is awesome. You have to try it. I feel so light, so free, almost invisible. Wait, what are you doing? Woo! See the floating hat? Woo! Don't freak out. It's just me and my new Clear Placebo Band. Get one from SkepticBros.com. Please put your clothes back on before you get arrested. Woo! I'm invisible. Now it's time for Dr. Rachie Reports with Dr. Rachel Dunlop. Well, of course, during the week, uh, a very sad story, extremely sad sad story. Actually, a five-week-old baby boy here in Adelaide died of whooping cough during the week. And um, although he was too young to be vaccinated, it's a very strong warning to all parents about immunising your children. So far this year, four children have died from whooping cough, a disease that is supposed to be preventable. Now, many parents around the country are choosing not to immunise their children for many different reasons. It's still a tough choice to make for many. It's hard to know what is the right thing to do. Well, one organisation that strongly believes all children should be immunised, of course, is the Australian Skeptics. And joining us today from the Australian Skeptics is Dr Rachel Dunlop. Rachel, thanks very much for your time. Hi, uh, Daniel. Thanks for having me. This is such a sad story. It's, it's, I've got a young boy. I've got an 11-month-old now. And uh, when, you're, when you're a father or a parent, you become so much more um, sensitised to these sort of stories. And to, to, to hear about a five-week-old baby boy passing on due to whooping cough is just um, a tragedy. 
Yeah, it's an absolutely awful thing to happen. Um, I mean, whooping cough is uh, a highly contagious disease, and um, as you mentioned, it is uh, preventable by vaccination, but um, it's spread by coughing and sneezing, so it can easily be spread amongst people. And also in, in children that are under the age of two, um, it's a very serious disease. It's, it's not just a cough, it's actually a very serious disease that uh, can have very serious side effects. And in about 50% of, of children under the age of two, um, it can result in hospitalisation. Mm. Uh, and also um, in you know, pneumonia, um, some, some children can actually uh, fracture their ribs from coughing so violently. Yeah. Uh, they often vomit after they've had a, a serious coughing episode. And if you've ever seen a child with whooping cough, um, you, it's a horrible, horrible thing to see because they actually are gasping for breath and they often turn blue just, just trying to breathe. So it's not just a bad cough. So, so you can immunise your child against against whooping cough. The reason why I ask is is because obviously my wife and I have immunised my young son Harrison. We were going through all our immunisation schedules actually last night. That's on our fridge at home, and uh, the twelve month immunisations come out very soon, of course. And, and we couldn't actually see whooping cough on that on that list that was distributed by our um, by our doctor. So, oh, okay. Well, like, yeah. is, that, is that involved in one of the early... Like, at what age would you immunise a child against whooping cough? Well, the, what you might be getting mixed up with, Daniel, is it's actually called pertussis. That's the right. actual bacteria that causes whooping cough. Yep. So it's known commonly as whooping cough, but it's caused by a bacteria called pertussis. Right. So if you look at the um, Australian schedule, it's actually scheduled for children at two months, right. four months, six months and four years. And it's actually um, given with um, tetanus and also um, diphtheria. So it's called DTP. Right, So okay. you might not have seen it because it's not called whooping cough per se. Right, on that the list. technical name yeah. is the one to look for. Well, and then that's, uh, you know, that was sort of alarming at, the, at, at that stage. We thought, oh, goodness me, what are we doing wrong? But um, we're, we're obviously following the immunisation charts very closely and ensuring that he's being done. So why are parents yeah. choosing not to immunise their children. I mean, I, I can't understand why you wouldn't. Why, why are parents choosing to go the other way? Yeah, that's, it's, it's becoming a big problem. Um, and I think part of the reason is that people have a lot of access to information on the internet these days. Yeah, we've been talking uh, about that, yeah. Yeah, which and sometimes the information you'll find on the internet is not right. Um, in fact, there's if you did a search for vaccination on the internet, you'd find a lot of stuff that's that's telling parents not to vaccinate. Now, unfortunately, this is um, not correct. A lot of it in many cases, and so if parents do spend some time looking up things on the internet, they'll come across scaremongering sort of stuff where. There'll be information saying that vaccines cause autism. I'm not sure if you've heard about that link, but that's quite a common I have. Uh, thing. That It's actually a myth, but it was um, sent around a lot. Based on the 1998 study by Andrew Wakefield that uh, came out um, a, a long time ago talking about the MMR vaccine, yeah, yeah. Um, also, parents tend to listen to celebrities and people in positions like, such as Jenny McCarthy, who's an American uh, representative for an organisation called Generation Rescue. Now, she does a lot of the talk shows like Oprah and, and yeah. the big American shows saying that vaccines can cause autism and that they contain mercury and that they contain antifreeze and, and use all these scary words. And, of mm. course, parents, are if you've got a, a, a little child, the last thing you want to do is... is make them ill like mm. you know p potentially giving them something like autism so um all of the there have been lots of studies actually into looking at a link between vaccines and autism and there's absolutely no evidence that that's true but that information is still out there and so it scares parents and it's kind of like daniel ringing a bell mm. once you ring a bell you can't unring it and so of course parents are choosing not to vaccinate and the other thing is to some parents from this generation haven't seen these diseases you know, a lot of diseases have been eliminated through vaccination, mm. um, for example, smallpox. And so in some senses, vaccines are a victim of their own success because we don't see kids in calipers anymore, in iron lungs. We don't see, you know, children dying from communicable diseases like we did. Mm. And so we don't seem to think it's a problem anymore. Any, any side effects whatsoever, regardless of autism, any side effects, uh, side effects to um, immunising? All that of you're course aware of? there are. Of yep. course there are side effects. I mean, any sort of um, 
drug that any drug that works is going to have side effects, and so there are um, adverse reactions to vaccines, and they are closely monitored and studied by the government and and by scientists. Of course, the obvious ones are you know you'll expect to get a sore arm at the site of injection. Uh, there can also be um, increased temperature, yeah. uh, and that's a result really of the fact that your immune system is starting to work because. Yeah. Obviously, the way vaccines work is you're injected with a very small part or component of the disease, uh, and then your immune system reacts to that so mm. that it's built up antibodies so that next time you come across that disease in the environment, you're already primed and ready to attack it. Yeah. So that means you don't get as sick as you would if you didn't have those antibodies in your system. So there are, there are well um, known and well documented uh, adverse reactions or side effects to vaccines. But the amount of side effects um, in most cases are so small that it, it's definitely worth getting vaccinated because the side effect from the disease is so much greater. So, I mean, all in all, exactly right, all in all, the, the benefits of vaccination far outweigh any mild side effect that may, may well be attributed to them. That's absolutely right, absolutely right. I mean, when, when we're talking about whooping cough, um, it's, it's also known as the 100-day cough by some people, and that's because uh, if, if you are old enough that you've had all your vaccines, now your, your son um, probably hasn't had all of his shots yet for whooping cough. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said before, you need to get four shots, um, and it's not until you've had all of those shots that you're going to be fully protected. So you can still get sick up to the age of six months um, with um, whooping cough. So it's very important to remember that, that you need to have all those shots. You need to continue to get those shots. And the risk of getting that disease far outweighs um, what you might get if it's a small sort of sore arm or a bit yeah. of a temperature for a couple of days. Yeah. And, and I guess the full immunisation rates may well be leading to these so-called sort of mass out outbreaks we're hearing about. Is that yeah, that's, that, that is a theory. Um, the the whooping cough epidemic that's been in, Australia, uh, in South Australia, um, yeah. just to give you some numbers, I mean, uh, between January 2010 and the mm. 15th of June this year, there's been um, uh, 2,277 cases have been reported in SA, and that compared with last year, there was only 1,500 in the same time. So there is an epidemic at the moment. Now, there are some parts of South Australia, and one of those areas is the Adelaide Hills, and that's where there's quite a low level of vaccination. Okay. Um, we have these little pockets all across Australia. Generally, the immunisation coverage rate for the country is around about 90%, which is pretty good, uh, considering that it's not compulsory to get vaccinated in Australia. What, why would there but, be a low level in the Adelaide Hills? Is that just... Uh, is there any particular reason for that? Is, is it like a culture yeah. or...? It's, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, in some cases, for example, there's another area in uh, New South Wales around the Byron Bay area, yeah. and that area is known for sort of alternative lifestyles. Correct, and, hippies. And and... Well, I didn't say that. You I did, did but... yeah, I did. Hippie. I've, seen it. I've, I've been there and I've seen them, plenty of Volkswagens. Right, well, those people tend to sort of shun conventional medicine, and so there's some thought that that might be similar reasons in the Adelaide Hills area, that, that some people that are sort of artists up there decide that they don't need these sort of vaccinations. Um, and, and so the bottom of the list for the August 2010 quarter of the coverage for vaccination in Australia, the bottom of the list came with the Northern Rivers region, which is the Byron Bay area, yeah. and, and then equal bottom was East Eastern Sydney. So one of the theories of why we're getting people that are highly educated and, and quite wealthy um, refusing to vaccinate is because they're the sort of people that get time to spend on the internet, they get time to watch things like Oprah, they okay. get exposed to the likes of Jenny McCarthy and, and that, that sort of stuff. Um, and then there's the kind of culture of the alternative lifestyles that, of the people that might live in the Byron Bay area that decide not to vaccinate as well. Oh, a fascinating study, isn't it? Just, just, just how things sometimes pan out like that. But um, in essence, as we wrap up, uh, Rachel, your recommendation, of course, it's vital that all parents should, uh, should have an immunisation plan for their kids. Absolutely. And the other thing that is really important about uh, this whooping cough uh, epidemic that's currently occurring across Australia is there's mm. a concept known as herd immunity. Now, this means that children that are too young to be vaccinated or 
people that can't be vaccinated for other reasons, maybe they've got an allergy to egg protein or mm. they have um, an immune disorder like cancer or something, we need to protect those people mm. by having everybody else in the community vaccinated. And so if you are a parent, uh, if you are a carer of uh, young children, uh, you should get yourself vaccinated so you can protect those that can't be vaccinated. And there's a great website called chainofprotection.org, which has been set up by the National Centres for Immunisation Research and Surveillance. Mm. And they explain this concept of herd immunity. So what parents need to do is they need to talk to their doctor. They need to find out if they need to get a booster because the whooping cough vaccine doesn't last forever. It does wear off. Mm. And in many cases, it may have been the parent who's carrying the bacteria that is infecting children around them. Um, mm. And the other thing is parents need to know this. Um, there, there was another tragic death of a baby um, earlier this year, last year, on the Northern Rivers. And the parents didn't realise there was an epidemic of whooping cough in the area. They didn't realise that they needed to get booster shots. And the government has been promising for a very long time that they will do an education campaign, making parents aware of that. Because, I don't know, you're a parent. Did you mm. know that you should get a booster shot? No, I didn't. No, I wasn't 100% aware. I mean, we you know, we, we ask our GP questions all the time, but uh, in terms of uh, knowing just personally off the top of my head, no, I didn't. Yeah, well, see, this is, this is the thing that the government needs to, to get this information out to parents so that they can protect themselves so that we can protect the vulnerable in our community. Outstanding and, and, and very well uh, very well said in terms of the, the, the final factor about that herd immunity. I mean, if you're not going to protect not only your own child but also protect the other people around you who can't actually have the um the vaccination so a very good point yeah it's really important so um if people want more information they should talk to their doctors also there's lots of very good information on the um uh health uh sa website so yes. that's at health.sa.gov.au um, you can find some really easy to read brochures about um whooping cough um, it tells you how it's, um, how it's passed on and what you can do if you're diagnosed. Um, there's also some very good information about vaccine safety and about the side effects we talked about before. So that's at health.sa.gov.au and if you search for immunisation, you'll find easy to read information for parents. Terrific, Rachel. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon and, uh, and, and hopefully people will heed that advice. No question about that. Thanks very much, Daniel. Thank you, Rachel. There we go. Dr Rachel Dunlop doing a great job there and explaining it. In layman's terms, very succinctly from the Australian sceptics, uh, the importance of immunising your child. And, well, generally, you think in, um, in our modern advanced society that would go without saying, but there are elements of, uh, of people, including, uh, as Rachel pointed out, a fair element here in Adelaide, in the Adelaide Hills area, that refuse to immunise their child or children due to whatever reason, due to... Um, you know, a more of an alternative lifestyle. Your thoughts on that? Eight double two three double O double O. Examining the truth and exposing the frauds, badpsychics.co.uk is the website that critically examines mediums, clairvoyance, and psychics. Follow the controversies, news, and discussions in the lively forum community. And now you can download your weekly fix of Righteous Indignation, the official podcast of badpsychics.co.uk that talks hard and critically about the paranormal. Badpsychics.co.uk, the UK's largest and most respected sceptical site looking at psychics. Holographic Pharmacies In 21st century Australia, one does not need to seek out witches in some dark coven in order to find magic potions and lucky charms with mystical powers. It seems all you need do is ask your pharmacist. For many years, Australian sceptics have lamented the decline of the Australian pharmacy or chemist shop. Not to say that there are any fewer of these shops in quantity, but the quality of what you'll find on offer on the shelves has been heading south on a bullet train with what seems to be a one-way ticket. In 2006, Australian sceptics awarded the Bent Spoon Prize to the pharmacists of Australia who managed to forget their scientific training long enough to sell quackery and snake oil in places where customers should expect to get real medical supplies and advice. 
In 2010, our poor spoon is bending even more under the weight of absurdities found in your once trusted local chemist. The tired old standard stock lines of homeopathy, or as the British Medical Association calls it, witchcraft, and ear candles, or as Australian skeptics call them, bloody ridiculous, despite our best efforts, are still to be found on the shelves of many pharmacies. I have seen, being sold in a pharmacy in Cronulla, an acupuncture fingering that claims to cure snoring. Many pharmacies also boast a computerized interactive display that dispenses dubious advice, including which homeopathic remedy is good for treating burns. I'm not making this up. Kylie Sturgis happened upon one of these displays in the city of Wagga Wagga. But now, in what I can think is a total abandonment of the last 200 years of science and common sense, the chemist warehouse chain are selling one of the range of holographic bands that claim no end of beneficial effects. On a recent visit to the chemist warehouse outlet in Ashfield, Sydney, I was able to buy a hot band holographic technology silicon wristband for $40. A look at the website of Hotband tells us that the product may help to improve balance, increase strength, provide greater flexibility, where have I heard those three claims before, deliver better endurance and stamina, improve focus and well-being, restore ionic balance, improve concentration, reduce stress, reduce jet lag, curb motion sickness, recover more quickly from sporting fatigue. All this from a couple of holograms about the size of a five-cent piece embedded into a silicon band, and it's all made in China. Imagine how empowered the Chinese factory workers must be. Stranger still, the advice from the assistant at the desk was that these bands actually work as claimed. You have to wonder about her basis for saying that. And how might these impressive achievements be accomplished? Now, the website goes on to tell us that hot band holograms are programmed with naturally occurring frequencies known to react positively with the body's energy field to help improve cell-to-cell communication. I wonder whether anyone from the management of Chemist Warehouse has actually read this gibberish. If these holograms with their programmed frequencies really did work as claimed, I would expect to see the following headlines in the world's press. Inventor of hologram bands awarded with Nobel Prize in both physics and medicine. Police on alert as hologram bands help drunk drivers to cheat roadside sobriety tests by improving balance. Hologram bands proven to work. Hundreds of athletes stripped of medals and charged with cheating. Holograms proven to affect human physiology. Credit card companies using holograms sued for millions for not disclosing this fact to their customers. Holograms emit strange energy. Thousands of people with pacemakers at risk. Australian skeptics challenge Chemist Warehouse to justify their decision to sell the hot band and we offer them and the manufacturer our $100,000 prize for a demonstration that the device actually has any real effect on human balance and strength. This offer also extends to all resellers and manufacturers of any similar wristbands or pendants such as Power Balance or Ekin. Thanks to Chris Higgins for the inspiration behind this report. And you can see the uh, report in full, plus some extra information and a video by visiting www.skeptics.com.au and clicking on the Holographic Pharmacies link. This is Desiree Shell, host of Skeptically Speaking. Check out our website at skepticallyspeaking.com and listen to us live on CJSR 88.5 FM in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I now return you to the Skeptic Zone. And we 
We're speaking to you now from the Think Tank Club uh, down the end of the street in a private room, which is very nice. I'm with Dr. Rachie. Hi, Dr. Rachie. Good evening, Richard. Good evening. We're here to interview uh, Jason Brown, of course, because of today's activities. Today's and yes, Late the breaking news. Richard, yeah. And this is all about something that's been happening in the last few days with a wonderful thing called, what is it, the Mini Q-Link or uh, something? Q-Link Mini. Q-Link Mini. Yes, it's a miraculous device. Jason, can you uh, fill us in all about this? The Q-Link Mini is a, a miraculous little device yeah. that you stick to your mobile phone. And what it does, you see, is it takes the, the frequencies that, are, that the mobile phone is pulling in from the air and that, that could harm your brain and converts them into something happy and fluffy can, and very nice for your brain. Yes. This is like a little holographic sticker, is that right? Um, it's not actually holographic. It's, not. it's just just a pretty colour. Okay. Uh, if I remember correctly, there's one in teal and one in lime. <laughs> um, or some, there's some sort of nonsense marketing colours like that. Oh, wait, my, my uh, cynical self is showing. I see. So this is a little sticker you put on your mobile phone, and it does wonderful things to prevent you being harmed by naughty radiation. Now, why has this been brought to our attention? Yesterday morning. Uh, Sydney's Daily Telegraph, which I believe is currently the best-selling newspaper in, in Sydney. Is it Possibly not? so, yeah. Um, put out a piece talking about these Q-Link Mini things. Yeah. Brand new online. product. It was um, online? It was online. I think it was in the actual physical paper as right, well. Right, okay. Um, this was written by um, a chap called Stephen Fennick, who's their technology correspondent. I don't think he's their technology editor, but he's a technology cons- correspondent. Right. Um, so he's talking about these Q-Link Minis, and it's, it's, it's a newly launched product, and it's quite amazing, astounding. Um, so these these things claim to uh, uh, stop the radiation from mobile phones melting your brain. That's very handy, isn't it? That's extremely handy. It's and so he wrote a report, really, isn't it? which was published um, at least online and probably in the physical paper itself. Well, I'd just like to pull you up on one small detail there, Richard. Oh, yes. You said wrote the report? Oh, yes, yes. A lot of it was in marketing speak, and suspicion is that it was just... <laughs> copied from <laughs> from the Q-Link manufacturers themselves. Or from a press release, maybe? Or from, or from a press release. He, yeah. he, he does... Uh, oh, I don't want to libel the chap, obviously. I had, a, uh, I had a chance to read this article, Jason, and I actually didn't really read it thoroughly. I just perused it. And when I came across the Q-Link realigns the body's energy systems to chase away the naughty I mean it was like I believe that was in the second paragraph <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes. and then I got to the, the paragraph that then said a naturopath said and that's that's what I, I finished think, I think they actually termed it naturopathic physician yes. said yes but yeah 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 this, this entire article was essentially uh, spruiking this product with very little evidence base and I mean we've heard this story before on the Skeptic Zone you know we've got power balance that we've talked about and the, and the Eakin bands yeah, and all, yeah. all of these kind of things this is basically power balance for your phone yeah no evidence whatsoever bunch of nonsense but it's in a national uh, national newspaper uh, from a reputable so called reputable journalist but uh, then kind of um, a, it came to our attention of course it did and uh, this is where the uh, the new way of doing things is really starting to show itself I think that's right. The yeah. internet. The internet. The internet was, detectives the internet, came out. The internet detectives just came straight out. The internet <laughs> is made, composed 50-50, cats <laughs> and detectives. Um, so basically what I've, what I've said in my own blog post that I've done about this, and I'm sure Richard will link to that. I will. Very kindly in the show notes. And your blog is? Uh, my colleagues are idiots.com. Thank you. Um, I actually said that when you try and pull the wool over the internet's eyes, the internet goes a bit nuts um, <laughs> so basically the whole of Twitter yesterday was I mean there's normally a little bit of a furor about journalists on Twitter we, we, we do tend to have a bit of a go at journalists because we like things to be right and we like things to be correct so it was all about Stephen yesterday uh, and, and today in fact um, he vanished at about 11.30 yesterday morning after saying this product has a scientific base and that was the and last we, thing he tweeted that's the last we've heard from him yeah as far as we know, he could be face down in a ditch somewhere. Now, of course, uh, I don't know if I was the first. I guess I was one of the first to put a comment on the story itself, and I, I waited for it to be moderated and published, and it never was. I, I dropped on at about uh, ooh, 11.30, 11.45, just before lunch yesterday. Yeah. Um, it, they never published a single comment on the story. 
And in fact, today the they closed off comments. Yeah. So the, the, the Daily Telegraph the completely closed off the comments, and then at the end of the day today, at about I think it was four thirty or so, actually pulled the story completely. Um, but one of the things you found out, Jason, was that uh, the guy uh, Fennec, his brother, has something to do with this product, right? Uh, well, I have to admit, I didn't find that out myself. Um, uh, I was told that by a chap called Downsy, uh, at Downsy on Twitter. Um, he dug that up, and I think he got that from Cameron Riley on Twitter. Hi, guys. We all follow <laughs> each other. Hi, Downsy. I know Downsy. He's friends with Craig Camber. Mm. So, um, basically, uh, Stephen Fennec is the brother of uh, whoa, Mario. Okay, Mario Fennec, mm. the rugby league player, ex-rugby league player, and now Channel 9 footy show pundit. So he's, a, he's an endorser of this Q-Link uh, you might have noticed has a, a naming similarity with Stephen Fennec, Mario Fennec, Stephen Fennec. They sound a little similar, don't they? <laughs> uh, it turns out that uh, Mario Fennec is Stephen Fennec's brother, and uh, Stephen did not reveal this in the article that he pub- published yesterday, 4th of November. He also didn't reveal that in the two previous articles that he published in 2004 on the Q-Link system. Uh, and... I mean, frankly, this is a bit of a breach of journalistic ethics. Um, Section 4, I believe, of the the Australian Journalists' Code of Conduct sort of says that you ought to reveal these sort of of, uh, conflicts of interest, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? It is interesting. Do you mean that there might be some professional bodies that would be interested to hear about this story, Jason? Well, there might. might, I'm, I'm sure... At some point, somebody will tell these professional bodies about these things. And I'm sure if you go to my blog, you might find out about who did that. Uh, So, yeah. But you you mentioned before that he, the last tweet he left was that there's scientific evidence to back this up. Mm. Indeed. Now, Um, you went through that thoroughly on your blog, didn't you? He had two tweets yesterday. One was, fabulous new product, cuts down the radiation from your cell phone. And then he got an at reply from uh, a chap called DDSD whose full name I've completely forgotten, I'm sorry, mate, Um, saying, so uh, this thing, does it work? And Stephen replied, yes, it's founded in science. Yeah. Um, And at that point, the whole thing was just exploding on Twitter. And he vanished. Stephen just completely vanished. (laughs) So I sent a reply to Stephen saying, um, so this thing's scientific, huh? Uh, I guess you'll have the links to the studies then. And I heard nothing, <laughs> apart from some chippet, chip, uh, chippets, crickets chirping, uh, and a tumbleweed went by. Uh, and, uh, a tumbleweed. <laughs> these kind of things. You know, a couple of gunfighters were over there and <laughs> shot each other. And tum- another tumbleweed came by, and I went right. Okay, I'll I'll check out the QLink website. And QLink has a scientific study section on their website. QLink Australia. That's the one. That's what I heard. It's like, <laughs> it's like I'm there again. I've gone back in time. Um, so they've got um, a scientific study section on yep. their website, which cites nine scientific studies. Now, wow. this being an audio-only podcast, you can't see my fingers the, the up the side of my head. Yes. Scientific studies. <laughs> um, so, um, so last night I, I sat down in my house and I went okay I'm going to allocate a couple of hours to go through these studies you know I've, I've gone through scientific studies before there's nine of them this is probably going to take me most of the evening I thought <laughs> so you know I, I sat there and I, I started downloading I, I pulled them down and they downloaded quite quickly I was quite suspicious about this um because normally a scientific study you know it's a, a meg or so and a pdf yeah and, you know you've got to wait for them to download these ones just fell into my desktop oh, quite mm. quickly. So um, I opened the first one, and it was uh, a study. I, if you'll allow me, I'll just pull yeah, this up on my, on my blog so I can see what's I did, going on. I did on. enjoy reading your blog, actually, I must say. Oh, everybody they enjoys do. reading my blog, Richard. They do. They do. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> www.mycolleaguesareidiots.com. And as one of your colleagues, I, oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. Long well, story. <laughs> so anyway, the... Um, The evidence goes like this. The first study is a a, a study entitled SRT and uh, Sympathetic Resonance Technology. This is SRT. Mm -hmm. Now, a slight digression. 
Yeah. We all know that homeopathy and the like work on a, a concept of sympathetic magic. <laughs> yeah. They've thrown in the word sympathetic right into their marketing. Do they think that we don't know what they're talking about? They do. Mm. They do. They th- mm. well they, for, for a long time now, a lot of people have gotten away with a lot of stuff. These days are coming to an end. Sympathetic yeah. resonance technology. So the, the first study is uh, entitled SRT, uh, Sympathetic Resonance Technology, and the effects of EMF. Um, that could be a, a 1980s band from the UK, or it could be <laughs> yeah. electromagnetic frequencies, on human brain cells, and that was done in September 2002. Now, this claims that it was done... Uh, let me see. I didn't note this in my blog, but let me just try to remember. University of Wollongong. Stanford University and one other university that I can't remember the name of apparently did this Um, it was a non-blinded well, single blinded uh, poorly controlled very small sample study Um, it seems like someone's been trying to just sort of practice what you'd do if you wanted to do a lame study basically and um, it was funded by Claris Products International LLC of San Rafael, California did they make who, who exactly is that company? Who, who's, who is that company? Who is that company? That, that company that would be is an independent in fact, government funding body, right? Yes? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that company makes the Q-Link bracelet. Dang. No. Now, and there were more studies, but basically... The, there were more studies, but the, 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 the studies chase. go on and on and yeah. on and on. There were live blood analysis studies, oh, and no. Dr. Oh, Rachie's done an article on live yeah. blood analysis. Uh, there were... So um, are you suggesting that the studies they put up on their website to back their, their product aren't probably what we would call proper and reputable scientific studies? Richard, let me put it in a single word for yeah. you. Yeah. Bullshit. Oh, I see. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, the, uh, the studies were... Nine of them, uh, poorly controlled, poorly conducted. Uh, and, I mean, you'll love this one, Richard. This, yeah. uh, as you are so well-versed with applied kinesiology, the last <laughs> two studies on the list were conducted by chiropractors using applied kinesiology as their metric. No. Oh, Richard's no. face palming. This I'm is brilliant. Really, I'm, I'm elbow palming and I'm <laughs> No, really. <laughs> really, really. Um, yeah, I, my. But how do you? What are you measuring there? Whether you're brain damaged or something? Well, the. the oh, oh, let, oh, once again, I'm wasting my time. You I are indeed. The, the, the title of those were uh, effects of Q-link dependent on muscle weakness patterns in the body, uh, and effects of Q-link dependent on muscle weakness and other chronic symptoms attributed to EMF exposures. So what we've got here is a mythical condition. EMF sensitivity. Yeah. Mm. Being treated by mythical practitioners, chiropractors, with a mythical methodology, applied kinesiology, with no blinding, using a mythical intervention, Q Link. Uh, and and I, I just, I've, it, I've just run out of things that I can say. But it gets worse. It gets worse because uh, someone brought to our attention that this product was mentioned on a morning television program. Oh, it was. Uh, either the, uh, the, in the last two days uh, in a, at any rate. It and was. We, we, we do by their uh, technology reporter. Now, I happen to have a just a little clip of the audio from that, which I'll play right now. Well, now to the new device that could protect you from mobile phone radiation. For more, I'm joined by Today Technology Editor Charlie Brown. Good morning to you, Charlie. Good morning, Lisa. Now, this thing is called the Q-Link Mini. Yeah, what that's is right. It? Well, it's a little five-cent piece-looking device. It's on the back of your phone. And the idea around it is, uh, if I can just take you back, over the years of using mobile phones, we've had devices that repel and shield us from radiation. Mm-hmm. Um, they were around sort of ten years ago. And now we've got, and we've got devices that... that take the phone away from your ear, such as an earpiece or USB, those kinds of devices, yep. speakerphone. This is designed to transform the, the radiation that is coming into the phone, and that's, that's through the, the signal, the antenna on the phone, transform it from something that's potentially doing you harm to something that is more in tune with your body's natural frequencies. It's a very scientific idea. The theory is that, that radiation, um, you talk, you, 
spoken to a couple of brain surgeons and they don't like people putting their phone next to their ear. They, they, they say it could potentially do damage. Charlie Teo has always talked he's about a, that. He's a big campaigner for that. Now, what this d is designed to do, is not, it doesn't actually repel the radiation or rate wave from the phone or anything like that. It transfers it. And so it, it's, it sort of absorbs it through the device into the phone, into your body, and it's no longer doing your body harm. That's what, the idea. What's it made of? I don't know. It's a, it, it, well, it's, it's, it's a proprietary compound they've designed, and they've been doing it for about 10 years now. And they've, they've said that they've done a whole bunch of clinical scientific trials, and they say that it, it is a lot better for you. And the types of things, when, when we talk about doing you harm, radiation isn't all about potentially causing you cancer. It's about... Uh, making your body feel more lethargic or, and tired um, and, and changing uh, and because it changes the, the types of radiation that your body is exposed to naturally. The jury is very much out it on is exactly out on how much damage not only the radiation does and, and the jury's out on this as well. Exactly. Well, my phone, I, I have an earpiece mm -hmm. connected to my I keep this thing as far away from my head as possible. I don't, I don't care what anyone tells me. After talking on this thing for a couple of hours, which is very easy to do, it gets hot and yeah. it starts to make my head perspire. So I keep it away from my head. This device costs about 50 bucks. It's saying it's working in a different way, but still designed to do better than putting your phone next to your ear, clean and, uh, and unprotected. Is this available in Australia right now? Yeah, you can now? buy it off their website. Okay. Hard question, sorry. Would you recommend it? Uh, I'd have to try it. I haven't tried it, and I'm very sceptical about people saying clinical tests say that this is going to work. Right. But, look, to be honest, anything is better... Err on the side of caution. Exactly. Anything's better than putting your phone next to your head for a long period of time. Yeah, good call. Thanks a lot for that, Thanks, Charlie. Lisa. The funny thing about that, though, was that, Richard, you noticed that two days prior to this appearing on the Today Show... They had Choice on two days in a row. They, they had representatives from Choice magazine the, yeah. the two days prior to uh, talk about different scams and products and things like that. And this guy, this Charlie Brown, this technology reporter, has been on the, the program in the past, which he has put up on his own blog, talking about scams and cyber scams. This is a different guy, right? This is not the guy who wrote the article? No, this is a different guy. This yeah. is the Today Show technology consultant yeah, or something Yeah, but, like yeah, that. he... Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, uh, whatever, I'm wasting my time. The <laughs> brain's exploding, isn't it's it? Exploding. It's exploding. It's exploded. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's kind of... I find it interesting that two technology correspondents who probably have some sort of association are both speaking the same thing at the same time. Uh, Jason, thanks very much for filling us in on this. Folks, please go to Jason's website to find a full critique of this whole thing, including the research he's done on the so-called tests... Now you two, why you've been there and I, we've been all, all been chatting. I've just had a message come in. Mm. All right, mm. I'm going to show. I'm going to turn my computer around. I'm going to show you this. Okay. Oh. Do I need to and get your take reaction? Deep breath. Yeah, have your sick bags ready. First, I'm going to show you the bottom of this page. As you can see, here's a page selling oh, these uh, another form of these power balancers. Right. Right. The company selling this is SBS. Oh. SBS. SBS. What? SBS, the broadcaster here in Australia, which we hold in high regard, I are selling being, uh, a holographic uh, balance bracelet for sixty dollars. Now, um, that one. our listeners might be in Australia, especially, but this show is available online. Media Watch, which is the uh, media watchdog here in Australia, we love Media Watch. We love Media Watch. Uh, media Watch is um, ABC's, the ABC being the national broadcaster, the ABC's uh, media feedback program. You can contact Media Watch with any complaint about the media that you like. Mm. And we have, in fact, contacted them about the Daily Telegraph story, and we will be contacting them about the Channel 9 Today program yeah. story. Yeah. Um, so watch out on Monday if you get this podcast by then. It might and, be on uh, Media Watch. We hope so. Media Watch. We're hoping it'll be on Media Watch. Well, the yes. other thing is, Jason, you're going to put this video up on YouTube, aren't you? This video will be on YouTube at my channel. You'll be able to find that through my blog, which I've already mentioned. No, but your YouTube channel is? My YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash stop that astronaut. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, um, just in finishing, this is a really interesting exercise in the fact that people just... I mean, first of all, this guy's a technology editor, right? Or technology commentator. Well, both of them are. Well, yep. yeah. yeah, but the guy who pulled the, the story was pulled. Yeah. 
the internet doesn't forget stuff. He right? should. Yeah. He should know. Shouldn't he know that, that the internet is entirely composed of so cats it's, and detectives? It's been yeah. twit picked. And yeah, yeah, Dave yeah. the Happy Singer yeah. gra- screen grabbed it, and we've yeah. all got it, and it's all been sent around no, Twitter. I've got the entire thing as an MHT file. I've got all the background from it. I've got the entire website of the QLink company. If they pull anything, I've got the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jason, if people want to follow you on Twitter now, where, where can they uh, go to? Oh, well, if they're listeners to the Think Tank, they'd already know this, but you can fo- find me at twitter.com forward slash drunken madman. That's the one. Thank you, Jason, for that uh, report. It's nice to see that we can actually get things done. The Twitter army comes into action. I, I like getting it. things I done. It. I love but it. But let's just make sure we, we know the Internet's not our private army. The Internet does its own thing. Yeah. And, you know, try not to annoy the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the cats. The detectives will be fine. And thank you, Dr. Rachel. Hang on, hang on. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. What a mixed bag it was this week. On next week's show, we have... You know, I'm not even sure what we have on next week's show. Sometimes I don't even know until the day before. But that's part of the fun, part of the magic of doing The Skeptic Zone. Hey, did you catch Dr. Rachi on the latest Geologic podcast? If you're not listening or you don't subscribe to the uh, Geologic podcast by George Hrubb, I recommend you do so. There's a fantastic interview with Dr. Rachi on the last episode. But until next week's show, which is a mystery to one and all... This is Richard Saunders thanking everybody who donates and subscribes to The Skeptic Zone. Yes, it helps a lot. This is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts and extra video reports. Skeptic Zone, a mystery.